we will get started now. Uh, for those that don't know me, I am Denise Guitara. I am the Maryland Conservation Advocate for Audubon Naturalist Society. And I thank you for joining us this evening uh, for a very get own uh, guest speakers uh, from Montgomery Planning Board. And before we get started, I will go over some of the agenda items, invite our guest speakers, and so go over some of the grand rules. All right, first I will tell you a little bit about AMS. Um, we were founded 123 years ago, and our mission is to inspire DC area residents to enjoy, learn about, and protect nature. And we do this in a variety of ways. We have a lot of programs that um, uh, are targeted to little kids and adults. Uh, our conservation department mainly focuses on policy and advocacy in the DC region. Uh, and we have advocates working in, in these regions. Um, our restoration department works primarily on restoring the natural landscape of our headquarters at Wooden Sanctuary in Chevy Chase, uh, both our meadows, our forests, our stream, and our education department is busy all year long um, educating kids from pre-K all the way to adults and during the summer with summer camps. And this year we're launching uh, many online summer camps. So to find out information about any of these departments or anything that we do, please visit our ANS uh, website, which we will drop it in the chat box. Um, also, we hold um, two conferences, which are Taking Nature Black and Naturally Latinos, which are alternating between uh, every other year. And if you missed out on our Taking Nature Black conference this year, you can go to our YouTube page and check out all the panelists that were present this year. All right, so today's, uh, tonight's agenda. So um, we will have around 50 minutes for the Thrive presentation. Then we'll have a three minute bio break. So you can get up, stretch, take a little bit of water. And then we will be answering the community questions. Um, and then we will have some closing remarks. Now I'm gonna go over uh, how you can submit your questions during the meeting. So whether you're joining us via your laptop or your computer or your phone, so either of these two screens might look very familiar to you. Um, we're gonna use the bot and the bottom of your screen, you have three buttons. So if uh, you wanna answer, you wanna post some questions, we're gonna use the Q&A box but we're gonna use the chat box for, um, if you want to have any IT uh, help, uh, Christian Mayoli, who's our Chesapeake Corps um, member helping us tonight. So please send him a, a message if um, you are running into any problems, but please use the Q&A box, which is the icon with the two double bubbles if you have any questions. All right, and with that, I will present our three guest speakers. Um, so first I have Wen Wright, who is the Director of Planning of Montgomery County Planning. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about her. So she's been the Director of Montgomery County Planning since 2013, uh, but previously she was the Chief Development Division of the City of Alexandria, Department of Planning and Zoning. Um, before that, she actually was working for Montgomery Planning from 87 to 2008. Um, and she began her career in Texas and has a degree in architecture and architectural history from Yale University. Also joining us tonight is Khalid Afsal, and he's the Special Projects Manager for the General Plan Update, as well as Steve Finley, who is the Area 2 Planning Division uh, Planner Coordinator. So with that, I will pass it on to Wen and her team. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to mention that on the call is uh, Carrie McCarthy, who is uh, co-leading with Khalid our Thrive Montgomery 2050 effort. 
uh, and um, she is chief of our research and special projects division. Uh, will be, I'm sure, very helpful if there are some questions that come up. So I wanted to just lead off uh, with a little explanation of what we'd be discussing this evening. So if we could go to the next slide. So we're going to start off with a, an introduction about the whole Thrive Montgomery 2050 effort and lay some uh, lay out some context and, and rationale for the project. We're going to talk about the framework and vision, how we've worked to develop goals and policies, and including some of our uh, pretty innovative community outreach techniques that we've used. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how we will be having a, a detailed implementation chapter uh, with the plan and then we'll really delve into the environmental recommendations of the plan because we think this audience is probably going to be most interested in that aspect. Uh, and then we'll go into next steps and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we've been working on the Thrive Montgomery 2050 project for nearly a year now. We kicked it off last June with what we called Thrive Week. We did uh, five different kickoff events in five different parts of the county. And we've been spending uh, close to a year listening to what we have heard from uh, the residents, from our elected leaders like our county council, from our appointed leaders like our planning board, and from stakeholder groups like uh, Audubon and, and others that are really invested in the future of Montgomery County. Uh, and from all of that, what we've really come to understand is that th the Thrive Montgomery 2050 plan isn't about reinvention. It's about adapting to new realities and shifting the way we think about how the county should grow. On the, uh, the image on the left on your screen is from the old 1964 Wedges and Corridors Plan. And it shows um, a vision for Montgomery County that was linked with the um, Washington DC being the the center of the universe, the, the hub, and uh, one corridor running through Montgomery County, which was I-270, with a series of corridor cities along that corridor, places like Rockville, Gaithersburg, Germantown, and Clarksburg. And the rest of the county was just a series of beige and orange blobs, <laughs> so to speak. What you see, however, on the right is where we are in 2020. The county has developed along the wedges and corridors model, but we don't have just one corridor. We've grown into a mature county with a series of um, activity centers and neighborhoods that we'd like to see develop into complete communities. And those neighborhoods are connected by um, a web of different kinds of corridors, transit corridors, uh, automobile corridors, and green corridors. So really and truly, rather than simply being one corridor through Montgomery County with a few corridor cities, which was the vision in uh, the 1960s, we see ourselves as a county that is really a web of communities and corridors. And we want those communities to be complete and we want those corridors to be vibrant connectors of each of these complete communities. But as we're thinking about how to get to that point, we know that we have to take into account all of the change that is happening in the world. And certainly in the last few months, it's change has been happening on a very rapid pace. But even before that, we were dealing with economic disruptions, social change, demographic shifts, technological innovations, 
and climate change and the impacts of climate change. All of those things are the context of how we're going into thinking about the next 30 years in Montgomery County and how we adapt to these new realities and shift again the way we think about how the county should grow. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to emphasize um, in terms of some of these uh, trends that we're seeing is the change in county demographics. The image that you see on the left was our 1990 uh, map of the county by racial or ethnic groups as defined by census track. The dark blue colors are white predominant the light blue or white majority. So you can see where we were in 1990. In 2016, there's been dramatic change. There is a lot less of the dark blue and light blue. There is a lot of yellow, which uh, identifies no predominant group, meaning no group with more than 50%. And there is a fair amount of green and uh, the sort of orange or, or salmon color, which represent um, areas of the county where there is a black majority or a Hispanic majority. We are a diverse county. We are now a county where the majority of our residents are people of color. And we expect by 2050 that it's going to be a very large majority people of color, maybe as much as 70% of our residents uh, as people of color. So diversity is our future and diversity is our strength. And we are looking at ways that we are going to be able to, uh, to embrace that and make it a part of our plan and our vision for the future. Uh, next. We also have an increasingly older population. Um, and this is also a dramatic, dramatic change. Uh, you can see that our um, population in, it, it, it is sort of interesting, folks who um, are uh, 45 years of age and older by 2040 are going to make up about 46% of our population. And people who are between 20 and 44 are going to make up about 30% of our population. So we are going to have uh, really a pretty much a majority of, of uh, working adults in our county are going to be over the age of uh, 45. Um, and this is a dramatic change. Uh, and we is going to influence how we think about growth, how we think about housing, uh, what types of housing are going to be most uh, useful as we have uh, uh, an aging, but, but very active and um, and uh, you know, dynamic population. Next, next slide, thanks. We also have a lot more people working at home. These were the numbers in 2016, 6.2% uh, uh, of our residents worked at home. I think after this experience with the COVID-19 crisis, that number is probably going to quadruple. Uh, or even go higher. I think we're going to see a lot of people working from home and that is going to change our commuting patterns. It's going to change our transportation needs. It's going to change our real estate needs. We may not need the kinds of new office buildings that we've contemplated in the past. And that's going to have an impact on our retail uses. It's going to have an impact on where people choose to live it is, um, it's a big, big change that, and it's a trend we see coming. Um, next slide, please. We also recognize that 
our current housing growth is not meeting the needs of our growing population. We are a county of nearly 1.1 million. And even if we are very conservative and expect really quite slow growth, we still anticipate having uh, about 200,000 additional people in this county by 2050. With those numbers, we would need to be producing about 4,300 units here. What we are um, producing, however, is right now about 2,700 units per year. So one of the reasons we're having an affordability crisis in Montgomery County in terms of housing is a simple issue of supply and demand. We have demand, we don't have a sufficient supply. Next slide. But what we have to think about is if we need more housing, where should that housing go? Where do we have space for it? Uh, in terms of empty land, the county is mostly built out. As you can see, we have only about 15% of the county's land area that we would consider unconstrained. And for the most part, it's the white areas that you see a lot of that is up, uh, up county um, and not necessarily well served by transit. So what this really means is that we had, need to start thinking a little bit differently about what our constraints are and what, uh, what areas are appropriate for growth. We have a, a saying in the, the planning department that we like to um, promote, which is that we turn parking lots into places. And that's something that uh, we take very seriously. We have to start thinking about tracts of land that we may never have thought of as being appropriate for development and uh, think about how we can perhaps think innovatively, do infill uh, design and construction and put housing where it needs to be near transit uh, and uh, not in a, in a sprawl format and not violating some of our um, goals to preserve green space and open space as well. So uh, it's, um, it's going to be a challenge, but this is what we think Thrive Montgomery is about, which is looking at new ways to think about um, problems that are facing us. One of the things I'll just mention that I really like about the title Thrive is that what it says to me is we can't just rest on our current successes. Montgomery County is not in crisis. We have a lot of great attributes. We have great schools, great parks. Uh, it's a great place to live but we can't rest on those successes if we want to meet the challenges of the future. We have to innovate, we have to think differently, we have to grow differently uh, and in order to thrive. We could continue to just exist, but we, we aren't going to thrive unless we make some changes. Um, next slide, please. So, our current land use is such that about a third of the county is um, single family zoning and about um, another third of the county is parks and open spaces and agricultural uses. So we have limited opportunities for uh, places to, to think about change. However, we are going to have to maybe rethink some of our constraints and some of what we've considered um, uh, uh, sort of uh, un unchangeable and start to think a little bit differently about how we can innovate, how we can build along our transportation corridors how we can um, 
fit in the additional housing that we need for the population that's expected to continue growing. Uh, it's a challenge, but we think that we're up to it and we think we have some great recommendations and ideas about how to uh, proceed with that. Um, this leads us into the, the vision for Thrive Montgomery and I'm gonna turn it over to Khalid Afsal to talk about that. Next slide. Oops, I left out one slide. Let me, <laughs> let me do that and then we'll talk about the vision. Um, one of the uh, things we realized is that there are some, some big shifts, some key themes that we need to think about as we make this plan for the future. It is going to involve some shifts and some of those shifts or themes include focusing on urbanism, especially along those corridors that I've mentioned. The idea of 15 minute living, the fact that we want a mix of uses so that people can get to the services that they need. Uh, they can get to parks, they can get to schools, they can get to healthcare all within about 15 minutes of where they live. We want to promote active lifestyles because we think that that's essential to the health of our communities. Uh, we want to promote uh, connections of people to places and really build our social capital so that we are um, not isolated. I think that's one of the, the downsides that we've had from this recent uh, issue of quarantine is that I think we've increased our feelings of isolation and that uh, doesn't promote strong, vibrant communities. And we need to think about those connections again. We need to look at housing as a right and a value. We need more housing uh, using innovative construction techniques in uh, the right locations and uh, dealing with affordability and attainability. So it's not only the housing for uh, people who are extremely poor, it's housing for young families starting out, it's housing for older people who may want to downsize and, uh, but stay in their own neighborhood. It's a lot of different housing types uh, that we have to focus on. We want to convert major roads into boulevards and really stop planning for cars. Uh, that is really, really critical right now, cars drive so much of what we see in our built environment, and we need to start thinking about um, planning for people, not for cars. We want to depave the county. That gets back to that idea of you know, parking lots to places, ways to, um, to take our imp impervious paved areas and turn them, like actually the image on this screen, Pike and Rose, into places that have green roofs, green spaces, trees, uh, and uh, become uh, those kinds of complete communities that we're aiming for. We need to have a variety of commercial uses. We certainly love our big um, employers and our um, government um, offices like NIH and FDA but we need small businesses, entrepreneurs, uh, light industrial uses, maker spaces. We need to have variety and diversity of commercial uses. We also need to look at regional solutions, not just for things like transportation, where there is a lot of conversation, but also for economic opportunities and for um, uh, housing opportunities. We need to be working closely with our regional partners. As I've said before, diversity is our strength. We are a marvelously diverse county and we need to embrace that and embrace the importance of place, understanding that each of our neighborhoods 
is unique and special and that we want to uh, keep that, maintain that, even as we change and uh, address the change that's needed. Now I think we're going into the next slide about our vision and I turn it over to Khalid. Thank you, Gwen. Um, so these themes that Gwen was talking about, they also help define the plan's vision. The full vision statement is included in the staff report that was presented to the board this afternoon. So I'm going to summarize the vision contained in that report. The plan envisions Montgomery County in 2050 to be a web of complete communities connected with vibrant corridors, as Gwen mentioned. And one thing before I go into that is that this statement is written as if you went to sleep, you woke up, you are in 2050, and you are seeing what's there. So that's the vision statement, how it's, how it's uh, written. So these complete communities offer a variety of housing types at various densities, mix of uses, and building types suitable for their location and proximity to transit. Uh, a mix of housing types affordable to different income levels in each neighborhood leads to social, economic, and racial integration of neighborhoods in every part of the county. Uh, these communities offer choices for residents um, by their mix of housing types so they can stay in the same community as they get older. And these communities are connected to local and regional employment centers via transit. In these communities, most people can live without a car and meet their daily needs within a short walk, bike ride, or transit trip. Residents have easy access to retail, schools, libraries, community centers, parks, and trails. With fewer cars and using clean energy, it has resulted in drastic emissions and improved air quality. Compact form of development has helped create more sustainable places. Redevelopment of low density uses, something that Gwen mentioned, um, development of large parking lots into compact walkable places has created better stormwater management, more energy efficient buildings and parks and public spaces that encourage a more active lifestyle. In 2050, our infrastructure has been upgraded to be resilient and adapted to meet the impacts of climate change. The county's major roadways, such as George Avenue, Rockville Pike, Route 29, Beers Mill, and others that currently in 2050 have uh, basically um, mostly traffic um, and automobile traffic. Uh, they have rail on our BRT and they have been transformed into safe and walkable corridors with mixed use centers around transit stations and missing middle housing along the corridors between these activity centers. This vision was achieved by keeping our focus on three major outcomes of strong economy, equity and environmental resilience, and by making sure that all our planning initiatives and implementation actions support and align with these three outcomes. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, how these goals and policies that we have presented to the board and, uh, and contained in the staff report were developed. The staff report contains about 46 goals, more than 150 policies and over 210 actions. That's a lot of guidance, uh, some of it a little too detailed, at least that's what we heard from the planning board. Uh, and one um, participant panelist from today. Um, next slide, please. These goals and policies were drafted based on community feedback, talking to experts and analysis by the staff. In terms of community feedback, we have used many different venues and techniques ranging from one-on-one -on -one meetings with citizens, meeting with small groups, having discussions, uh, at either uh, community uh, public places or um, with the community places where they meet, homeowner association meetings and large community events. Staff has gone to almost every festival and gathering uh, starting last June when we had official start of the project. And even though the first phase was focused on learning about issues and challenges, a lot of the feedback that we got all along included ideas and suggestions about how to fix the problem we are facing and we are likely to be facing. On the technical side, we have talked to experts uh, with various, on various topics, ranging from land use to transportation, environment, and other areas. 
We have had our two winter speaker series on topics related to the general plan update, and we have a technical advisory group composed of county and state agencies and some regional entities that focus on land use planning uh, and planning related issues. We've also conducted a lot of research analysis of issues and possible solutions that the plan should consider. We have several staff working groups with various areas of expertise. Steve Finlay is leading the staff working group on this on the sustainability related topics and you will hear from him uh, in a few minutes. We've also conducted a number of technical studies to explore the issues in more detail and uh, gain an in-depth understanding of the issues, but also their context and the complexities uh, involved in addressing them. All of these studies and research is available on the project's website at www.thrivemontgomery.com. And as you mentioned before, the first draft of goals, policies, and actions is just the start of the discussion about how we should prepare for the challenges we'll be facing in the future. Uh, next slide, please. In response to the pandemic situation in the last two months, we have quickly switched to online outreach, just as the planning board has been doing all its work and public hearings online. Uh, we have done things, including points with planners. Um, Gwen has printed Ask Me Anything online chats. One of them was also co-hosted by one of the planning board members um, with live questions and answers. <clears throat> We are on social media. <clears throat> this week we had a panel discussion focusing on the LGB LGBTQ community. And for the whole month of June, uh, we have also started community chats with the planner where each uh, meeting is focused on one topic and staff team leader makes a brief presentation and answers questions from the community. The community chat about sustainable environment will occur on June 23rd from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And again, all of this information is available on project website at www.thrivemontgomery.com. Uh, next slide, please. Implementation. Um, Carrie, since you are here, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I'll talk about it. Um, so the implementation chapter is important to ensuring that the plan isn't something that just sits on the shelf, but that it's a living document that we really use to promote positive change in the county. Um, now that we've finished the very first draft of the goals, policies, and actions, we'll be turning our attention to implementation. And from the beginning, we've thought of the general plan as something that will set the department's work program for the foreseeable future. So the implementation chapter will identify the tools we need to implement the plan, a number of additional studies that we'll need to look at specific issues in more detail, the types of public and private investments required, and zoning and other regulatory changes required to move the plan forward. Another really critical component of the implementation chapter, sorry, I have a very friendly cat. <laughs> um, you know, is to help us prioritize the short, medium, and long-term priorities. As you've heard, the plan has over 150 policies and 200 actions. Um, and whenever you have a to-do list with that many items, you really, it's really important to figure out what are really the 10 things you need to get started. Um, the implementation chapter will identify roles and responsibilities, what issues the planning department leads on, and what other, we need other departments to lead on. It will include coordination with other initiatives, including the County Climate Action Plan um, and the capital budget. And while the plan itself will not have a detailed set of targets and metrics, you know, we will give some thoughts to what are really the key metrics that are most important overall for moving the plan forward. Um, and lastly, you know, often smaller plans are really driven by cost benefit analyses or fiscal impact analyses. Um, in this general plan, we're not going to include that level of detail, you know, but certainly for individual components and as we work through um, the additional studies and tasks required to implement the plan, you know, we'll be certainly carefully considering the trade off of different policy recommendations. I think this is over to Gwen and Steve to talk more in detail about the environmental policy. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, and if we could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, 
I'm going to be uh, trying to take you at least briefly through the environmental section specifically uh, uh, of the, the general plan rewrite Thrive Montgomery uh, 2050. Uh, I want to start by noting some things that we identified kind of up front that we wanted to prioritize. A lot of this had to do with uh, newer uh, issues that have certainly come on the scene since the last time we did the general plan. Uh, climate change, uh, absolutely at the top of that list. Uh, we did not uh, have that in mind the last time the, the general plan was done, which was a long time ago now. Um, so climate change is one of the, the key uh, themes that we focused on, uh, both, both uh, mitigation and adaption, as well as uh, planning for resilience. Uh, we're also responding to a lot of new knowledge that's coming out, a lot of new data that's coming out about environmental issues and how those issues affect health, both positively and negatively. Uh, and we're trying to, to fold that into our uh, recommendations. Uh, environmental justice has been a concern for some time, but uh, growing in concern year after year. And a lot of that actually also overlaps with both the human health and climate change concerns that we now have, uh, because those issues disproportionately affect uh, people of color, dis historically disadvantaged communities. So there's the equity issue there. Preserving biological diversity has always been a concern. Uh, but I know a number of you have probably followed some of the reports that have come out over the past year or so, just about the, the number of species that are imperiled at this point. Uh, so these were all uh, particularly major themes that we wanted to be keeping in mind as we went through this. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, but uh, I also want to mention again, kind of what level of recommendations are in the plan. Um, I, I, it occurred to me to, to say that this is a guidebook, not a roadmap. If you're planning to take a trip somewhere, you might start by, by consulting a guidebook and figuring out where you might want to go, the things that you might really want to see, and especially the things you don't want to miss. Uh, but then once you've figured out the things that you want to see, the places you want to get to, and what you don't want to miss, then after that, you sit down and you get out your map and you chart out your course about how to get there. So this is really at the guidebook letter level. These are the, these are the places we want to get to. These are the things we don't want to miss. And from this, we will then start to, to chart out our course about how to get there. Uh, so these are high level recommendations to establish really where we want to be in 30 years. We do have some action items, uh, some how to get there items, but it's certainly not the complete route or the itinerary. And as was mentioned again, this is the beginning of the conversation. We now have a document for you to respond to. Uh, so uh, we hope you'll take the opportunity to read through the document and over the next couple of months to give us some good feedback that we can incorporate into the writing of the plan for the draft plan in September. So next please. Uh, so actually, I want to start out by taking a look at some of the recommendations for a healthy and sustainable environment that are in some other chapters of the plan. And this is actually one of the exciting things to me about this plan. Um, plans in the past that we did uh, tended to be very siloed. Uh, if you wanted to know what the environmental rec uh, recommendations were, you went to the environmental section. If you wanted to know what the housing recommendations were, you'd go to the housing section. And that made it easy to find all the recommendations. It may be harder for you to find all of the environmental recommendations in this plan because it's woven throughout all of the chapters of the plan. Uh, but on the other hand, that also means that you can't just skip over the environmental section. Uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, community development and design, you are going to be getting some environmental recommendations in there because they're, they're woven throughout the plan. I want to just show you some examples of this. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So our first chapter is called Complete Communities. The idea being that we really want to uh, be able to have people access most of their most basic needs within uh, a fairly compact area to allow it more possible to walk or to bike, to take care of those needs. Uh, uh, 
this is the idea behind everything being accessible within about 15 minutes, uh, 15 minute walk or bike ride. Um, but that is um, a, a recommendation that will help to cut down on carbon emissions and help to, uh, to preserve some of the, uh, the outlying areas. So um, this is the idea, the goal that uh, will retrofit communities, create new communities where people can meet their daily card, uh, needs without getting in a car. Uh, second chapter is called connectedness, and that really has more to do with uh, being uh, socially connected and connected with each other. But you'll see that this also notes uh, accessibility and being able to connect to parks and open spaces and recreational areas, uh, in part so that you have gathering spaces where you can make those connections. But it also it says uh, connect residents to nature. And one of the action items that is, is included in the connectedness section is to create a nature access action plan uh, that will allow people to, to connect with uh, some sort of natural area, uh, some green space uh, within 15 minutes, a uh, 15 minute walk of their house. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, diverse economy is the, the third section and that's focusing particularly, uh, obviously on developing a robust economy. But for, among other things, economic reasons, uh, but also environmental reasons, here's an, a recommendation to expand non-auto transportation options between and within the county's major employment centers. Uh, so again, a recommendation that uh, is made in the, in the economy section does benefit the economy to be able to provide this. People look for this sort of thing but it also benefits the environment. The safe and efficient travel section, this is our transportation section. Um, and again, these are just highlights. There are a lot more recommendations in each of these chapters. Um, but this one is really, I think, uh, very bold in, in uh, some of its recommendations. The first goal, get people out of their cars. We talked about not planning for cars anymore, but uh, planning for, uh, mobility of people rather than moving vehicles, uh, including public transit, walking and bicycling uh, as the preferred trips uh, uh, way to, to get around. Goal number 4.5, eradicate, I love that word, eradicate greenhouse gas emissions and dangerous pollutants from the transportation system. Um, the, uh, there are recommendations in here and that is, that is what the goal is going to be is to um, to be able to eliminate those uh, emissions. And you know how much of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the transportation section. It's, uh, it's, it's over 40% in Montgomery County. Uh, policies include facilitating the mass adoption of zero emission vehicles and uh, promoting the integration of climate adaptive re resilient design. Um, this has to do with the fact that uh, if you think about, and we talked about this in some of our meetings, uh, the times that you might hear that the metro is, is shut down or has slower speeds imposed in the summertime because it's gotten so hot that the rails are starting to, to warp. Uh, so imagine having more hotter days and what that might do. Imagine some pavements that start to get soft. So there's a need actually to look ahead if we're going to continue to be able to get around and, and integrate uh, new recommendations into how we, we design and construct our uh, transportation systems. Next slide, please. Um, affordability and attainability is primarily uh, focused on uh, housing and housing needs, but even that section has a policy to enc encourage affordable, sustainable green development and environmental sensitivity in the design and redevelopment of housing projects. And this is important for the affordability reasons as well as for the, the environmental reasons. Um, if you are a resident and, and you don't have a lot of money, if you're Oh, Steve. Uh, we can't, yes. We can't hear you. You're, you're froze. I think, but you're back, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're back. 
Okay, sorry about that. Must be my my connection. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, so anyway, uh, affordability is, is aided by by uh, making green developments uh, if it helps save residents on utility bills. Um, diverse and adaptable growth is kind of our, our more classic land use uh, chapter. And there's quite a lot in this chapter that uh, relates to uh, the environment. Uh, again, uh, this idea of developing the county is an interconnected web of uh, both transportation corridors but also green corridors, um, developing a plan to, to link natural areas uh, with our, our urban areas by providing uh, tree-lined boulevards and natural corridors to, to create these green linkages. Um, using public space and redevelopment to build resilience and respond and adapt to climate change. Uh, most of the recommendations about the agricultural reserve are in this chapter seven, and I know that's uh, at something that's of great importance to a number of you who are here uh, listening tonight. Uh, so uh, one of the policies in this section is to maintain agriculture as the primary land use in the agricultural reserve, uh, to promote farming, uh, support farmland and open space conservation, and to protect our environmentally sensitive areas and be able to use the space to help us respond to climate change. Uh, so um, very important recommendations in this section. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, and this one's really interesting. This is our design arts and culture section, and this has to do with urban design, but they have uh, really latched on to uh, the importance of uh, responding to climate change in this, and, and one of their goals is to use this urban design as a tool to avoid and mitigate the negative effects of climate change. And they have quite a number of recommendations in, in here. Again, this is just a, a select few. Uh, retrofitting single-use commercial developments and car-oriented communities uh, so that uh, they are not all built just for cars, but uh, incorporate ways to be able to get around without having to use uh, an automobile. I love this action item. Develop a sprawl repair manual for the county with ideas to help uh, to retrofit some of the areas that, that we have built for cars and make them more about being for people. And this will help the environment in the, in the process. Make high impact sustainability features such as net zero buildings and district energy top priorities. Uh, create design guidelines, regulations, and incentives to help the county achieve its goal of uh, achieving the, the net zero uh, uh, emissions goal by 2035. So quite a lot in this chapter as well. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, I thought that we needed kind of a break from the words. Uh, we, um, we're throwing a lot of words at you, and I don't normally put those many words on a slide, but I thought a lot of you here tonight really wanted to see exactly what the, uh, the, the plan says, what the words are. And I haven't included them all. There's just not room to do that. But I thought I'd throw on a picture of an otter uh, just to kind of break things up. But after I did, it occurred to me that this is actually, uh, you know, something of importance. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, maybe you've known for a long time, but when I was working for the Parks Department, the first time I heard reports of uh, otter sightings in Rachel Carson Conservation Park, uh, that was really thrilling to me, uh, to be able to know that there's a place in the county where you can go see otters. And um, so this is one of the things we're hoping to, or planning to, uh, to be able to preserve is, is these uh, natural areas that have the ability to uh, accommodate um, some of the, the wildlife that makes us really believe there are still wild areas left in Montgomery County. Uh, so having taken a quick otter break, now we're going to jump more specifically into all of the words of the, or most of the, many of the words of the environment chapter. But again, these are just excerpts. Uh, there's just not time to go over all of it. But let's go ahead and, and dive into it here. So we have uh, a number of goals, and I'm going. To, what I've done is try to break this up largely by goals. Uh, the first goal is to 
uh, use the this compact form of development uh, in order to be able to avoid sprawl, really, I think is is the easiest way to say it. <clears throat> uh, to create a smaller footprint, uh, accommodate peop the people that that are going to be coming into a smaller footprint, and and in that way, to be able to protect the uh, the agricultural reserve, the 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 wilder parks and natural areas that we want to be able to save, and also these are this form of development is going to. Uh, help reduce our, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, allow us to get around without cars, um, and uh, to uh, to really be a be more sustainable and more resilient. And at the same time, a lot of this is being done through infill and redevelopment. So we are doing things like turning big uh, existing parking lots that have little or no stormwater management, little or no vegetation turning those into places that actually can accommodate people using the land better and incorporating more uh, green features and stormwater management into them as we go. Um, as we do that, we know we are going to have to design for the climate change impacts that we know are coming, the heat island effects. So we need to have some uh, guidelines, urban environmental guidelines that will help us to uh, be able to figure out how to address climate change, provide cleaner air, and especially the shading and cooling features uh, that will help cool the area and, and help deal with health issues. Um, this uh, next policy is about planning in three dimensions. Um, we're talking a little bit about that uh, earlier uh, with the planning board. Um, looking at a forest as an example of a uh, a sustainable, resilient community, and realizing that a forest is a three-dimensional uh, entity, and there are processes that are occurring at every level within the forest, from the canopy, which is receiving energy and trans transferring that energy or, uh, into more usable forms, uh, creating food, um, helping to filter air and, and water, uh, down to the, the lower levels in the forest floor, which is where there are places for, for things to live uh, and for mobility, the most of the mobility to happen. But also then below the, the ground, the soil layer has a lot going on in terms of uh, environmental services. And so uh, the, the thought is that, that especially as land becomes uh, more and more valuable and using it efficiently becomes more important that we start to look at building faces and building setbacks and rooftops and also the, the below ground area to be able to accommodate all of the processes that we need uh, to accommodate all of the needs that we have, including generating energy, uh, treating stormwater um, and uh, uh, things of that no, uh, sort, as well as providing room and, and soil for trees. So next slide. Uh, the second goal is our, our major climate change goal. Um, and uh, we have uh, obviously, one of the first things I want to point out is that um, part of the goal says we want to move the county into a, a, a climate positive future. And you can see that there is a little definition that's included in the footnotes. Climate positive means going beyond achieving net zero emissions and removing additional carbon from the atmosphere. If we have a goal right now in the county to be net zero by 2035, then by 2050, we ought to be able to do better than that. So we, th we thought we would go ahead and program that in as the goal for climate change is to go beyond net zero by 2050 and actually be removing more carbon from the atmosphere, more greenhouse uh, gas than, than uh, we're emitting so we can start to clean it up. Uh, you do see an, a reference there to the Climate Action Plan. I think I might have seen a question uh, pop up earlier about whether we were coordinating with that. We are. Um, there uh, actually, there is a member of our uh, environmental working group on each of the uh, Climate Action Plan working groups uh, so that we are able to, uh, to coordinate with them, to make suggestions, to hear what they're doing. Uh, I was in a meeting just last night with uh, Adriana uh, Hushberg and uh, DEP 
uh, to look at the buildings and, and uh, clean energy section as we work with our uh, the new consultant they've hired. We want to collaborate with regional partners. Um, we need to be concerned about things like the county's water supply and distribution systems. Um, we know that climate change is, is going to make that uh, a bit dicier and a big part of the county's water supply is protecting our watersheds and then also the infrastructure that goes along with treating it and distributing it. Uh, policy 6.2.4 en enhance the county's climate resilience uh, by looking at other uh, infrastructure. I'll just give you one example of that. Our stormwater uh, pipes and stormwater treatment systems are designed for storms that were the storms that we used to be getting under the climate that we used to have, but that's changing now. So we need to take a hard look at the capacity and the ability of our stormwater uh, infrastructure to be able to handle uh, the, the heavier rains and, uh, and flooding events. Uh, next slide. Uh, continuing on uh, climate change, uh, needing to reduce the county's energy demand, and we want to really go to local energy distribution uh, and, uh, and things like uh, distributed energy rather than the old centralized section, uh, centralized energy generation and, and distribution, and to, to generate everything we need by clean, uh, renewable uh, methods. Uh, need to, to figure out how best to site alternative energy production and to incorporate energy production even into new building design. We know we have to reduce heat island effects uh, by better sh uh, shading and cooling um, and expand. We do have a reference here to the Agricultural Reserve specifically uh, remembering that, that it's going to be essential to helping us uh, to adapt to climate change. Um, this next policy, 6.2.8, is starting to get into some of the environmental justice issues, recognizing that uh, there are communities uh, in our county uh, where not only have uh, some more unwanted land uses been visited on communities that uh, uh, really didn't have the, the political uh, ability to, to fend those off, uh, and, and past planning decisions that have uh, uh, disenfranchised these areas. Um, and they need uh, both, they need public investment really, and you'll see public uh, uh, and private uh, issues listed there, but we need to invest in these communities and uh, some of them, uh, we, we're looking at the tree canopy throughout the community to see if whether, whether there's a deficit. Um, a lot of you are, are uh, very concerned about municipal solid waste and, uh, and, and developing a robust composting uh, program trying to eliminate municipal solid waste. We, we have recognized that in here. Next slide, please. Um, health was incorporated, human health was incorporated into the environmental section. Um, and I think it's an appropriate place for it to be. Uh, my colleague, Amy Lindsay, was really heading up our uh, health uh, recommendations and has formulated a, a good number of these, uh, starting with ha incorporating health in all policies in the county, uh, but also recommending that uh, we allow uh, all residents to be able to have clean, breathable air. Um, we're recognizing again the extent to which uh, particulate per, uh, pollution uh, contributes to uh, unhealthy uh, uh, people and poorer health outcomes, including uh, from COVID-19. Um, reducing vehicle miles traveled and developing guidelines to reduce air pollution. Uh, considering the health threats of climate change, um, you know, this again uh, is important as uh, heat is the, the number one weather killer of people in the United States, more than flooding, more than storms of any kind, more than high winds, people, uh, more di people die from extreme heat. We're going to be seeing more of that. And so uh, that's a major health threat um, that we need to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also uh, touch on continuing to make sure we uh, protect communities from excessive noise. Uh, we want to be concerned about nighttime light levels. 
especially near natural areas. Some of you may have seen the studies that show that firefly uh, populations around the world are uh, being affected by, by too much ambient light at night from developed areas. Uh, goal 6.4, we have a few recommendations about making sure that to keep people healthy, they need to have access to, to safe, uh, convenient and affordable healthy foods. Um, I like the way Amy said that uh, this, uh, she said that uh, um, she, at one point this was a policy, she said food should be a goal, not a policy. And, and I agree with that. So I'm glad that she elevated this to, to a goal. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the more uh, uh, kind of classic environmentally focused, natural resources focused goal. Uh, to preserve, restore, enhance, and expand, and sustainably manage uh, natural and other uh, uh, areas to support human, animal, and plant life. This is the one that deals with biological diversity. Um, it deals with uh, water quality, air quality. Um, I just saw a, a good a good comment: "Isn't food a right, not a goal?" Uh, we didn't have a, we didn't have a category of rights in this. Uh, in this document, although we identified housing as a right. So it may be a, a good, good thing to identify food as a right as well, I would agree with that. Um, so uh, one of the policies, this having more to do with uh, water quality, but also preserving more green space, uh, limiting and removing existing impervious surfaces uh, when and where we can, gets to this whole notion of uh, depaving the county. Uh, protecting, enhancing, and increasing the coverage, connectivity, and health of natural habitats such as forests, non-forest, street canopy, wetlands, and meadows, the, the major critical habitats that support the biological diversity in the county. We went to conduct a study to figure out really how much forest and non-forest canopy, um, it, how that affects uh, health uh, and, and uh, both human health and natural health. And, uh, and strive to achieve uh, those, those targets. Uh, we want to take another look at the SPA program. We know that uh, that has not achieved all the goals that were set for it originally. So we think it needs another look uh, to see if, it, if that can be approved, uh, improved. Uh, recommendation to develop a long range forest quality management plan to address fragmentation, deer pressure, and invasive threats and to address uh, climate impacts. Next slide. Just a few more and then we can take a break. Uh, reduce and manage invasive and other problem species that uh, pose no significant threats to green areas. I know this was another area that was brought up in our conversations with our environmental partners. Uh, we think it's important as well and that's in here also. Improving water and stream, water quality and stream conditions uh, throughout the county. Uh, again, uh, protecting uh, stream conditions means protecting the watersheds that serve those streams. And then finally, developing some incentives for developers uh, to restore ex existing streams and daylight pipe streams during the redevelopment process. Uh, so this is a sampling of uh, kind of the, the sorts of things that we covered in our environmental recommendations. Again, there are others. I didn't have time to cover them all. Um, and again, letting you know where we are in the process, we have just released, these are draft, and again, I stress draft, vision, goals, policies, and actions. So we finally have a, a document with some real uh, substance to it uh, that we hope you all will, will read and respond to. Um, next uh, item that we will be working on is creating the working draft. And so we'll be able to take your recommendations through the summer uh, we'll probably have to start to nail down a, a draft sometime in, in August to be able to get it formatted to, and to the board in September. But we've got a couple of months uh, for you to read and respond to this. Uh, then the planning board review and transmittal um, in October of 2020, and then eventually county council approval, um, uh, hopefully uh, starting in April 2021. Uh, so I believe that uh, we can't, we want to take our bio break. I think I ran over a little bit. Sorry about that. It's a lot of material, uh, but I'll let uh, Denise, uh, she's got a timer started here. And so uh, right. go ahead, Denise. 
Yes, thank you so much, Wen, Steve, Khalid. And uh, we will take a three minute bio break. So if anyone wants to make use of these three minutes, um, feel free to go out and um, take a sip of water or something. Uh, and then keep inserting your questions in the Q&A box. I know we have a couple already. So we'll be back in three minutes. All right, time's up. <laughs> and I will stop sharing my screen so that we can all see each other much better. Uh, I will start with the Q&A uh, box questions and feel free uh, to alternate between any of the planning staff members to answer them. Um, and then we will also be reading some of the chat box questions because I know some participants answered uh, put them in there and actually my colleague Christian, he's gonna be reading those as well. So I'll start off with the first one. Um, aside from affordability, what are other precautions if not meeting the housing demand? So I can uh, take a shot at addressing that, but I encourage uh, Khalid or Carrie to um, <clears throat> speak up as well. Um, I think if we do not meet our housing demand, we are going to um, suffer not only in terms of affordability, but also in terms of the economic health of our county. I was, uh, you know, I have been involved in the recruitment process for new employers. And one of the things that they want to know when they want to think about whether to uh, bring jobs to Montgomery County is where would their employees live? Uh, are there places for people to live that are relatively affordable? We aren't talking about, you know, very, very um, low rent subsidized units. We're talking about really what I call attainable housing for middle income people. And um, when they are uh, concerned that there really isn't a good uh, quality of life for their employees and the ability to find good housing, they become less interested in locating their businesses here. So it's not just um, an affordability issue, it's, a, it's an economic issue and it's an equity issue. I think that we really do believe that for us to be a truly equitable community to have the provision of housing for people at every point in their life, at every stage in their life, from young people right out of college all the way to older people looking to retire and downsize, that we have to make sure that we have enough housing choices and enough housing units uh, to provide uh, that kind of equity. That would be my response. And I would add to that, Mr. Khalid, that um, from the very beginning when we started working on this plan, we realized that all of these issues, I can't remember any that stands alone and would not have impact on any other parts of life and generally what we are discussing here. We identified three major outcomes, basically three legs, uh, economy, environment, and equity. And Gwen mentioned two of them. And the third is that it has a huge environmental impact. What's already happening is that because the county is becoming more expensive, especially the transit areas and down county areas where all the employment is, people have to go farther out to find affordable housing. But the jobs are still, and they're getting more concentrated in transit oriented areas, transit uh, centers. So they have to drive back in. Uh, same with uh, services people are providing from plumbers to you know, school teachers and everybody, they're coming into the county to teach the students, so they're driving. And if the driving is the only option, they are increasing greenhouse gas emissions, other environmental impacts. On the social side, they're spending more time in traffic, not with their families. So there are, it's, it's a whole chain of issues that just cascades down to other areas. Great, thank you. Christian, want to have the next question? Yep. Um, so this first question from the chat is related to green space. So this question is referring 
to the fact that a lot of green corridors like Sligo Creek and Rock Creek have been um, under increased pressure during the pandemic. So their question is if due to these circumstances, is the planning staff reevaluating the components of the master plan um, in terms of green space, amounts of green space? Does it affect what the uh, right number is of green space for the community? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take a uh, stab at that for starters. Um, and I, I think my, my response is yes, but we're just starting to evaluate that as we are, are recognizing what the, the effects of the, the COVID uh, pandemic are. We actually have a, a work, uh, uh, a work team. We have a team that's assembled right now that's starting to look at um, how we take into account the pandemic that we're seeing now um, and understanding that there's a, a possibility that these sorts of things may happen more frequently in the future for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and so we were in a meeting just recently talking about uh, both the need to have spaces where people can congregate, but maybe some flexibility built in so that there are places where people can be able to get out into nature or get into green spaces and, and be able to be socially distant. We may have to develop uh, some flexibility in the way that we design these things in order to be able to accommodate that. Also, the Parks Department uh, has been looking at closing uh, some of the, the roads through the parks uh, periodically in order to expand the available area for people to be able to get out and use the park without cars uh, occupying that space. Uh, so that's something that, that they're looking into here. I know other places are looking into as well. Um, and so my response is we are, we are beginning to look at that. We are having conversations about it. Um, and uh, I think we're hoping that within the next couple of months here, uh, we'll, we'll have some recommendations very quickly pulled together to address those, that question that you're asking. Great, thank you, Steve. And we have a question about um, if there will be unused office buildings because more people are teleworking, can those buildings be converted into housing to meet the housing demand? I can answer this one. Um, so the answer is um, yes, but it, it depends on a lot of factors. Like we've seen some trends in off, office conversions. There's a great project in downtown Silver Spring called the Octave. Um, it is a little challenging in some cases given the floor plate sizes of some of the office buildings that are quite large and that makes it more challenging to convert um, to residential uses. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variables in considering office conversions. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, we're thinking a lot about how, you know, the future of buildings and how to make sure buildings are flexible. Um, we're launching a mixed use development study to look at trends in mixed use and, you know, what's happened in the past and what are kind of future, um, more flexible mixed use of uses that we should be considering how to support. Great, I can uh, go to our next question. Um, I'm gonna combine some ideas, but focused around uh, climate change and the environment. And so this question is referring to, uh, I believe you mentioned the daylighting of streams. So someone was wondering if you could explain more about what that process is and how will stream restorations in the area be incentivized and how might that be impacted by uh, increased drought in the region due to climate change? So Steve can talk a little bit about what daylighting of streams means, but I'd like to just sort of talk about how we're focusing on that idea in many of our master plans. So Steve, why don't you describe what daylighting is and I can talk about what we've been doing. Sure. Um, well, basically a lot of our areas that uh, were developed uh, some time back uh, started out by essentially uh, going into areas where there are existing streams, uh, putting those streams into pipes, and then essentially paving over that part of the watershed. So there are streams that are actually running underground um, underneath of existing development um, 
and naturally there's a lot that cannot happen in a stream that is running through a pipe. Uh, most specifically, um, first of all, the flow is concentrated, and so when it comes out the other end of the pipe, it tends to come out at more of erosive velocities and erodes uh, the stream down uh, if it, when, when and where it comes out of the pipe, causes erosion downstream and that kind of damage. There's no opportunity for the water to uh, infiltrate into the water table uh, in and out of the stream to be filtered. Uh, it's not a good biological habitat. So um, as we uh, go through some of our redevelopment processes, there are sometimes opportunities to identify uh, those undergrounded, those piped streams, and to actually uh, remove the pavement from over top of them uh, to create a, a more natural channel for them to flow through again so that uh, they can uh, perform more of the, the needed uh, uh, environmental functions and create a, a biological habitat that's functioning once again. So we're actually bringing those streams up to the daylight. Yeah, and what um, I want to give you as an example is uh, right off of Georgia Avenue, there is a park called Evans Parkway Neighborhood Park, and that is an example of a stream that was underground, but our parks department restored that stream and brought it back above ground, so it is a um, you know, open flowing stream, you can see where the park ends and it goes back into a pipe under the ground, but at least for the length of the park, it has been um, exposed. And Steve gave you all the reasons that that's a good thing to do. I also wanted to mention in terms of streams, we are actively working on a tree planting program uh, that is called uh, Reforest Montgomery. And we are using funds that have been uh, collected either through uh, penalties for people who violated our forest conservation law or people who paid fee in lieu um, fees. We're working closely with um, a number of groups in the community to identify private property where trees can be replanted and stream banks can be reforested. And we're also working with our parks department um, to reforest stream banks that are on parkland. Uh, the group, one of the groups we're working with very, very closely is um, the Countryside Alliance, Caroline Taylor. She's really been fantastic in helping us find a number of private properties to, uh, to plant trees on along stream banks and to help begin to restore those streams. Great, thank you, Stephen. And we have some definitional questions. Um, people are asking, what is compact form of development? Habitat restoration? And I think that's all. I can take on compact form of development and Steve can talk about maybe habitat restoration. When we talk about compact form of development, we're really talking about trying to um, have building footprints and building site design be as efficient as possible with as little paving as possible. Uh, we are very interested, for example, in working with Montgomery County Public Schools to look at getting them to build more schools that are two or three levels uh, rather in a smaller footprint rather than a large one story uh, sort of sprawling school, school that covers a larger uh, area and creates more impervious surface. So that's the idea of a compact form of development. I'll let Steve talk about the um, Habitat. Okay, I'll, I'll try not to make this a treatise. Uh, uh, habitat uh, restoration uh, really covers a lot of ground, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's start with the notion uh, or the understanding that a habitat is where something lives. And uh, typically when we're talking about habitat restoration, we're talking about uh, an area that's home for animals or sometimes for plants. Um, and those uh, 
living things have certain basic requirements for them to be able to, to live in and for them to thrive. Um, we were just talking about restoring streams as an example. And streams uh, provide a number of different kinds of habitats for a number of different kinds of, of aquatic creatures. Some of them need pools and some of them need riffles. Some of them need a particular kind of uh, gravel substrate. Um, those are just a few examples. Uh, the temperature of the stream and shading make a difference. Uh, over time, through uh, various different uh, uh, things that degrade the quality of the stream, whether they're, they're actually buried or whether erosion uh, starts to uh, erode the stream banks and uh, widen it and eliminate uh, if they get channelized uh, from, in other words, straightened out, either artificially or because they're carrying too much water, then habitat can be lost for certain creatures. And when the habitat's lost, they can't live there anymore. So for streams, we might go in and start to uh, put back in uh, some uh, bends in the stream, uh, which help to create these riffle and pool uh, habitats. Uh, we might uh, sh do some stream bank restoration uh, and put in some rocks and overhangs that create um, shelter areas for the, the creatures in the stream. Um, any number of things we might do there. On the other hand, it, if you're talking about maybe a, a, a land habitat uh, for certain kinds of animals, uh, there may be uh, birds uh, or other creatures that need a forest of a particular size uh, or in a particular structure in the forest. Uh, Maybe the forest has been uh, degraded because of invasive plants that are coming in that are pushing out the native plants that certain species require in order to be able to fulfill their life cycle. So uh, removing invasive plants, restoring uh, uh, native plants might be part of the habitat restoration. Uh, providing the right kind of nesting areas, bluebird boxes is a kind of habitat restoration, uh, providing uh, uh, cavities for them to nest in that, that may have been eliminated. Uh, planting particular kinds of species, enlarging the size of forests by planting around the edges. Those are all things that are done in order to restore the requirements that are necessary for a, diverse, a diversity of, of animal species to live. So it depends on where it is, it depends on what the habitat is, and what the goals of the restoration are. I know we're getting close to the end of our time together, and I've seen a couple of the questions um, that really sort of are about what is this document and how does it relate to more uh, local or uh, sector area plans. I do want to emphasize this project we're working on, Thrive Montgomery 2050, is a policy document. There will be no rezonings or land use changes that come specifically out of this effort. What this project does is it lays the, um, it lays the framework for our future work program in planning in the county. It gives us our marching orders of what our elected leaders with advice from the planners, from the community, from everyone in the year 2020, what they want to see us go forward on from a policy perspective. And it helps us prioritize what projects we're going to work on and it helps us really create direction. But I do wanna be clear that it does not actually result in any rezoning. Once this effort, the general plan is complete, we in all likelihood will embark upon a series of other either sector plans or small area plans that will study specific parts of the county in greater detail and that will make land use recommendations and that may result in rezonings. Uh, but they will be under the umbrella and the policies that are endorsed by this Thrive Montgomery 2050 plan. So I just wanted to clarify that. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we definitely got more questions than we had time to answer, but I will definitely save all the questions and pass them on to our fabulous planning um, team. And then maybe we can send you all the participants a response of any other questions that were not answered. Um, I will drop in the chat box the Thrive email if you want to send planning board any questions. Thank you so much to Wen, Steve, Khalid, and Carrie, and Christian for um, helping run a very smooth presentation today. And thank you so much. And we look forward to being engaged and helping out uh, spread out the Thrive 2050 message for all county residents. And we want, we want to thank you, Denise, thank you and the ANS team for uh, helping to, for, for putting this together, really, and just inviting us to come in and, and talk and share some of this with folks. And we will uh, try to get to any questions that we weren't able to get to tonight and find ways to get people answers. And, but we really appreciate uh, you, Denise, and uh, partnering with you and in the Audubon Naturalist Society uh, in, in being able to reach out to this community. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. Stay safe.